Yeah, so my name is David Fenyo and I'm a professor at New York University. Um, and my group uh, works uh, on uh, integrating different types of um, uh, biomedical data and uh, with a focus on uh, integrating proteomics and genomics. Yeah, so, so by, by looking at the, um, the correlations between different, these different data types, uh, we can better understand the underlying biology and, for example, uh, find uh, modules that, uh, or proteins that uh, are uh, working together in, uh, in complexes. Um, we can find the uh, transcriptional regulation um, and also uh, signaling on the uh, phosphorylation level. And we can, uh, by looking at how the, these different measurements are correlated, we can then understand how um, uh, the, the biological function of the cell and try to um, elucidate the complexity and, uh, uh, of, uh, of these functions. And also in cancer we can then uh, see how these uh, uh, cellular networks are uh, dysregulated and uh, can uh, uh, lead to, uh, to cancer. So when we're building these uh, uh, predictive models, um, we, we always have to make a trade-off between uh, uh, having a complex model um, or uh, a more simple model. And uh, what, what we, when we make it, the model too complex, then uh, we risk uh, overfitting our data and then it, the model won't generalize very well. But uh, on the other hand, when we make it uh, uh, too simple, it won't uh, uh, have very good predictive power. So we have to find this uh, balance between, uh, uh, between simplicity and complexity. And uh, this is something that will depend very much on, uh, on our data, that depending on uh, also this, both the size and the quality of the data, um, how complex we can make uh, our models. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, this is a question that we, uh, we get a lot, but uh, um, uh, the mainly it is that they are very complementary, the measurements. Uh, when we measure, uh, do genomics and transcriptomic measurements in, uh, uh, in tumors, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, things that change. And it's very difficult to prioritize which uh, of these changes are important, which of the, the changes drive uh, uh, the cancer. Um, so by Adding in the proteomics, we, what we can do is use the proteomics uh, to prioritize which um, um, of the genomic changes are uh, actually important. And the main reason for that is the, uh, the proteomics, uh, I mean the proteins are the functional gene products, so those are uh, the ones that are closest uh, to phenotype. Um, so if, uh, for example, we have genomic changes that don't result in any changes uh, in the protein, uh, proteins, then uh, probably they are less important than the ones that lead to dramatic uh, uh, protein changes. Yes, so people have um, done that. Uh, uh, other groups, including uh, my group, have worked on uh, applying proteogenomics techniques to, um, to different uh, infectious diseases, um, including uh, HIV and malaria. And uh, the, the, the angle that uh, we and our collaborators did was to um, look at uh, the, uh, the immune response uh, to, to these infections. So there the, the, proteomic, uh, the proteogenomics approach was to uh, uh, first uh, do targeted sequencing uh, of um, uh, the variable regions of uh, antibodies and then uh, to get a, a survey of the, uh, the immune response and then do a, a targeted uh, mass spectrometry approach to find 
uh, which of those uh, antibodies have high affinity to uh, the, the infectious agent. Yeah, so we are very interested in um, actually expanding uh, bioinformatics uh, and computational education into the uh, many different aspects of medical education. Uh, both um, in uh, during medical school that uh, uh, doctors should already then learn to um, be able to handle um, and analyze uh, uh, both clinical and uh, molecular data. And uh, as, as we've seen, there's more and more um, data that uh, uh, more and more measurements that are done on uh, patients that result uh, in data and it's very important that uh, medical doctors um, understand how uh, what are the possibilities of computational methods that can um, help analyze these data sets because they are the ones that are best placed they see what's needed in the clinic and uh, the data is available. So if they also uh, understand what, uh, uh, what's possible uh, with computational methods, I think then we can really uh, uh, much faster change uh, and improve uh, healthcare based and, and really make it uh, um, uh, uh, sort of predictive and based on data. So I think in, in some aspects we are already achieving it, but it's a very, very special um, areas. Um, like uh, one thing uh, there is, we, we, in the treating diabetes, for example, uh, we do uh, personalized, uh, practice personalized medicine today because we, uh, based on uh, measurements, we adjust the medication on maybe even a daily basis. But it's still, uh, these are very limited cases where we can do it. And to really do it on a larger scale, I think we, that for that we still need uh, a lot more uh, research. But, uh, but we are uh, slowly getting there and at least today we can um, imagine how we would uh, get there, even though it might be um, uh, quite a few years away. So uh, about 50% uh, of our genome is made out of uh, uh, remnants of uh, retrotransposon sequence. So this is a very large part of our uh, genome and uh, uh, most of these are uh, truncated, so they're not active anymore, but they, at some point they were uh, active. Um, but there are about 100 positions in the genome where there is a full length of the one retrotransposon called line one, um, and that uh, have the potential of um, uh, being active. And the activity in this case means uh, that they are uh, transcribed, uh, proteins, uh, two proteins are made, uh, one protein binds to its own RNA and actually both bind to its own RNA and one of them is uh, also an endonuclease and a reverse transcriptase. So after this uh, rubber nuclear particle is imported, um, it can, uh, the one protein can cut, the endonuclease can cut the genome and in uh, reverse transcriptase and insert itself in a new position. And this, of course, can, uh, uh, if it's inserted into uh, a gene or a promoter region, this can cause all sorts of problems because it can uh, disrupt the gene or, um, so uh, it really, uh, the, uh, the host has developed uh, really uh, a very efficient suppression mechanism. So the retrotransposons are not, um, uh, uh, are in most somatic cells not active. Um, but what happens in a lot of tumors, what uh, uh, people have observed is that uh, we get uh, transcription. And so we uh, uh, approach this with a proteogenomics approach where we look at both uh, the transcription 
and, uh, and the uh, uh, proteins. So, so what we've seen is that um, we can see very, a lot of transcription factor binding uh, to, uh, to retro, line, the run, run retrotransposon um, and we can see that it has uh, uh, a lot of uh, transcription in certain tumors and uh, uh, it uh, also has, uh, the proteins are uh, produced. And uh, finally, we, can, we have also developed a method to look at uh, novel insertions uh, in the genome. So, so taking this together, we are now looking also at uh, uh, what host proteins are needed for this process, what uh, uh, proteins they, uh, they interact with, and we are looking uh, at what regulates this both on the transcription factor level but also on the, um, the translation level. Um, so, um, and uh, the, the, the nice thing is that the, uh, the proteogenomics data that's coming out of uh, several labs nowadays on, uh, on tumors, uh, we can actually do these uh, studies with uh, existing public uh, data. So my name is Carl Clauser. I am a principal scientist at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard uh, in Boston. And I have been for quite a few years now doing uh, research in uh, uh, proteogenomics, uh, mainly oriented around cancer. The research that we do is mostly uh, trying to analyze tumors that come directly from patients where we're trying to get an overview of the, uh, the, the proteomics and the genomics of cancer. And so what we seek to do is have uh, tumors from, uh, from over 100 patients, and we want to have depth of coverage that uh, in the proteomic side is, say, 10,000 proteins or more. So in order to make effective use of instrument time, uh, we use a, a multiplexing strategy that involves TMT labeling, peptide fractionation, and then uh, uh, automated mass spectrometry that does LC, MS, MS, and uh, doing that, uh, we get both proteomic information and phosphoproteomic information. And the phosphoproteome information comes from a step that, uh, of isolating and enriching for phosphopeptides used using immobilized metal affinity chromatography that gives us one set that we do proteomic work and one set that we do phosphoproteomic work. Then we, that collects uh, millions of mass spectra that uh, software is used to interpret the spectra. I'm responsible for building some of that software. Uh, and that creates uh, large amounts of information that we then seek to integrate with genomic information uh, and learn things about the cancer process and processes and how to uh, put uh, different types of cancer into uh, better classifications and help uh, ultimately to get better treatments and diagnostics uh, for patients. Well, so DIA is data independent acquisition and DDA is data dependent acquisition. And I think amongst the practitioners in the field, there's a bit of controversy uh, at this point, right? So the DDA is a bit of older technique and the, the engineers that build and design instruments have been for many years working to, to do that very well, okay? Uh, and DIA has, has emerged in the last few years as uh, people with those instruments basically trying to run them in a way that gets what they like to think of as, as more comprehensive data uh, uh, by collecting many things at a time and some people would, would say that it makes the data a, a bit more of a mess. Okay? Uh, simply put, I think it's like uh, people who are fans of DIA are a bit like New York Yankees fans that live in Boston. Okay? I myself am a Boston Red Sox fan. And as far as where I stand, let's just say the Red Sox won the World Series this year. Okay. Now, if I take, put back off on my scientist hat, I would say that we're probably headed for uh, 
an area, say with the next generation of instruments or so, where the two techniques are gonna become uh, more merged, right? So the instrumentation is already becoming faster. Uh, and I think DIA makes not enough use of that information in order to trigger acquisition. And some of the compromises that are currently made to collect data in a DIA fashion will uh, no longer be limiting uh, it, with, say, one, one more generation of instruments. And you will, you will have uh, instruments being fast and sensitive as well as being specific. And I think that combination will be, look a bit more like what traditional DDA uh, is. Well, I think my lab in, has, is already producing data that's of high quality and gets published in top-notch journals, but at the same time, it's a bit like being a, a homeowner. You got to live in the home and your family grows and you want to make the home a better place, right? So things are constantly uh, being improved, but I think we're already to the point where we, we can claim to be robust and reproducible, but that's not to say that we're satisfied, right? We would like to be, uh, be able to do things more efficiently. Uh, we'd like them to be more robust and more reproducible so that we can uh, get even higher quality data. Well, so, so it's already possible to do in a high throughput manner to do phospho uh, proteome analysis. We uh, are now doing acetylome uh, analysis where we enriched for acetylated peptides, peptides that are acetylated on lysine residues, and we do that using antibody enrichment with an anti-acetyl lysine uh, antibody. Uh, the phospho-peptide enrichment today is do, done by using an immobilized metal affinity chromatography approach. When we have a complete data set, uh, those data sets often have um, significant numbers of missing values that make in, uh, drawing conclusions from those data sets harder. Uh, if we can improve it, I think uh, the enrichment process is probably one of the most uh, limiting things uh, at this point and the most room for uh, improvement. Uh, sensitivity, any way you can get it, always helps uh, these things. Uh, and I guess that's, that's sort of the major features. That, that Inevitably, I think right now we also have a certain amount of uncertainty with, with regard to localizing the sites of modifications when you have multiple residues that are possible to be modified in the same peptide. And the limitations in doing that are not really software, they're more uh, the underlying data. So MSMS uh, fragmentation tends not to give complete sequence, and so you often end up with uncertainty. So in today, when we do phospho um, proteomic analysis, maybe 70% of the phosphopeptides we identify, we can confidently localize the site to a particular uh, serine 3 and tyrosine residue. Uh, and if we had more complete fragmentation, that would improve. Okay. For acetyl lysine containing peptides, that's much less of a problem because there's not as much uh, potential for there to be multiple lysines in a peptide. Okay. And if there is, it's going to be one lysine at the C terminus because of triptych peptide and another lysine that is somewhere else that's probably the acetylated one. So it's uh, less of a problem with localization. Well, I think in order to do good, do good science, you always need to have good samples to start with, right? Most of the work that I am involved in uh, these days uh, is related to the CPTAC uh, program that is uh, in the United States uh, run by the National Institutes of Health. And at this point, the, the tumors are collected under a, a protocol that has been optimized to make sure that we can get as uh, good a proteomic data quality as possible. Those samples come from different places in the world. And, and as it's critical, I think, to, ha to have an effective program, to have partnerships with uh, hospitals and uh, cancer centers that can provide those uh, materials. Now, if we were to improve the technical uh, aspects of our work, 
uh, particularly by being able to work with less and less material and still get uh, the, as information, uh, the data quality out that we want, we could do even better. So right now, we tend to require a bit larger tumors that are often uh, easy for uh, surgeons to obtain uh, from patients. And what we're actively trying to do is reduce the amount of material that it takes for us to generate the data so that we can work uh, effectively with just biopsies uh, of tumors. And then I think that is going to open up uh, areas to larger uh, studies uh, that hopefully can uh, produce even better data. Uh, hi, so I'm Kelly Ruggles. I am an assistant professor at uh, NYU School of Medicine. I'm also the director of academic programs for the Sackler Institute, also at the NYU School of Medicine. So um, I'm involved in both research and education at NYU. And my lab really focuses on multi-omics integration, um, proteogenomics, and microbiome, and cancer, lots of different areas, but really interested specifically in looking at how we can integrate these diverse data types to understand human disease. Yeah, so a lot has happened since the Human Genome Project, um, and mostly because the technologies have become so much better. So we're able to assess uh, genomics at a much higher depth. We have much higher coverage. It's become much cheaper to do um, sequencing. So we have many more sync, uh, organisms that have been sequenced, and um, we can look at things like epigenetics and the transcriptome and all sorts of levels of omics data. So um, there's a tremendous amount that's been done. Um, in terms of the limitations, you know, we still have only sequenced a small percentage of the, the total organisms that are, are on the world. So there's a lot more we could do, but um, we're limited with that. And also, um, we, to get really good depth with like whole genome sequencing is still very expensive. So I think with time, we may see even more improvements as the te technology improves. Yes, yeah, so mutation status, uh, we deal with a lot, um, specifically with our cancer data, because it's something that we're, we're really interested in, and is, is understanding how somatic and germline mutations are identified and, and how they affect um, tumors. And so um, the actual identification of variants occurs um, through several different pipelines. Uh, the TCGA, so the Cancer Genome Atlas, has been instrumental in um, coming up with these informatics pipelines that allow for variant calling from either whole genome or whole exome sequencing. And there's also SNP, SNP arrays that are available. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Um, and it's been really well developed because of all of the work that's been put into this. Um, and like I said, a lot of it's been done by the Cancer Genome Atlas as well as other big consortiums and smaller groups as well. So um, we've, we've made a lot of progress with that. And uh, I think it's become um, a really interesting way to, to understand cancer. So microarrays um, have sort of come, gone out of style as RNA-seq has, has become the primary method for, for measuring the transcriptomics. And um, the, the main reason for this is because with microarrays, you really you need to choose your genes before you measure them. So there are specific probes that you pick, so you pick a certain number of genes, essentially, that you're able to measure, and then you only can measure those. But with RNA-seq, you're able to measure everything that's in your sample. So it's, a, it's an unbiased approach, and it's something that um, has really pushed the field forward, having the ability to not choose beforehand what you're measuring and really um, uh, being able to measure whatever you want in your sample. It's a good question. Um, you know, they're both they're both really uh, important, and 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 they're good methods. I think that the main reason to use one or the other is usually cost, and the question that you're asking. So, whole exome sequencing with exomes, especially. So, if we're if we're talking about the human genome, for example, it's about two percent of the genome is an, is exome. So, if you want to have really high depth and and really high coverage of, of what you're, you're sequencing, you would, would choose exome sequencing if, 
if you don't have you know, an unlimited number of funds. So if you're lucky enough to have a ton of money, then whole genome sequencing is a great way to go because you can get a lot of information about the non-coding regions, which we're learning more and more are extremely important to um, understanding the cellular process. So it really depends on your question and it also depends on how much, how much money you have to spend. Single cell RNA-seq is, is a really hot field and technique right now. Um, it's something that I am not doing specifically, but I work with um, and collaborate with a lot of people who are doing single cell RNA-seq. And it's, it's a method where you're able to measure, um, to, to separate cells out one by one and measure specifically the gene expression within that cell. Um, so there are a couple of methods that you can use to do this, um, one of which is to, to use droplets and you're able to put cell, each cell in a different droplet and actually do the whole library prep within that droplet and barcode the, um, the, the RNA for each cell within the droplet and then sequence all of them together and pull out afterwards um, the specific cell-specific RNA expression. Um, and it's a really interesting and great method. Um, for understanding heterogeneity of samples. Um, and it's something that the coverage right now is not very high. I think it's about a, th a, a thousand genes, depending on how people do it. So I think as, again, as our te the technology improves, I think this is going to become an, an even more exciting field. Sure, yeah, so CPTAC, um, the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium is, is, uh, is, is um, funded by the NCI and, and within the NIH, and it's a, it's a great consortium because we're, we're working, it's a large group of us who are working together to try and understand cancer using proteogenomics. So you we're using proteomics, phosphoproteomics, genomics, transcriptomics um, to really try and understand if we integrate this data, can we identify biomarkers, can we find signatures, um, can we understand drug toxicity and predict how people will respond to different drugs. Um, so trying to, to harness all of this data to really understand the clinical aspects of, of cancer and come up with new ways of treating and diagnosing people. So um, it, we're working on a lot of different tumor types right now and um, it's something that's going to continue to go on. I'm part of one of the data analysis, um, consort the data analysis teams. Um, so we're really working, we're in, we're in the data and we're trying to figure out how best to analyze this data and how best to understand um, cancer using even more um, levels of data than we've used before. That's a good question, yeah. So I, I would love if we also had um, metabolomics data. So um, metabolomics data, you know, really complements proteomics and genomics data in that you can see exactly what sort of enzymatic reactions are occurring and you can try and figure out if there are certain things that are building up in the cell or if there are certain parts, pathways that are up or down that are causing um, different metabolites to, to change in terms of their concentration. So that's something that I think, um, you know, is, is another data type that we can really benefit from and it's something that's becoming more and more popular in these multi-omics analyses um, that I personally would be really excited to work with as well. Um, my lab works on a lot of, um, and creating a lot of open source tools and we work with a lot of people who create open source tools. and. You know, I think it's, it's a really um, important thing for us as a scientific community to contribute. Um, so open source meaning, you know, we, um, we create these pipelines that we, we can make public. Something that my lab and something I'm particularly interested in is making things um, uh, interactive. So having it be on a web server and um, having it be available for people who, who aren't computational, who can upload their data and, and really explore it in an interactive way so that they're able to ask their own questions um, and not relying on someone who is a bioinformatics expert to always be taking their data and doing something with it and giving it back and having this iterative process. I think having um, this sort of um, 
Having it available to the scientists themselves to ask their own questions and play around the, with the data is something that I think is really important and something that we should all work towards, um, especially the computational field, if allowing other scientists to really, who don't have the same skills, to really um, be able to look at their data themselves. So I, I'm very, very involved in our computational biology program at NYU. I'm, I'm part of the master's, uh, I help lead the lab master's program and I'm very involved in the PhD program and, you know, training our scientists at this point to really understand how to also do some programming or to at least understand how the programming works. They don't have to become experts. You know, we can't all be experts in these fields and I think also really teaching people how to be collaborative. I think we're, we're at a point in science where we all rely on each other and we, it's hard to run a lab and just be insular and do everything yourself. So having you know, people who do the wet lab and people who do the informatics and people who sort of translate between those two and training our next generation of scientists to um, understand this and be able to work it better in groups I think is something that's really important um, and also um, just training them to have the statistical and computational background that um, is required to, to drive the field forward, the entire scientific field forward, I think is something that we all need to think about and, and invest in. Mm -hmm.